So I'm going to try covering a lot of things in a short amount of time, but the real meat and potatoes of this video will be showing you how to set up, power, and control four of these 16 by 16 matrix panels. It's actually quite easy to do, but can be a little bit overwhelming if you're trying to do it for the first time. To get started, on the back, you have the beginning leads, which is what the controller will eventually be plugged into. You have the power injection wires, and here you have the end connector, which can be used if you want to connect additional panels. There's many different ways you can go about getting things set up, but for this example, I'm going to start things out with the power injection wires. Now you can certainly use the ones that are already soldered on, but they are pretty thin and not very long. So to make things a little bit easier for me down the road, I'm going to solder my own thicker and longer 18 gauge silicone wires to the panel. And this process is no different than soldering your own wires to the beginning of an LED strip, which I do go over in great detail with close-up footage in my Soldering for Beginners video that I made that I highly recommend checking out if you're interested doing it this way instead of using the wires that it comes with. Now as for power, since I'll eventually have 4 panels connected, which will be a little over 1000 LEDs in total, I'm going to be using a 5 volt 60 amp supply to run the matrixes that are all using the 5 volt WS2812B pixels. So I've had a few people mention that instead of putting the stranded wires in the power supply terminals like I've always done, I should instead use something called ferrule terminals which creates a better connection point and just an overall safer end product. And even though I've never had any issues doing it the other way, it seems like a very quick and easy extra step that I for sure don't mind doing. And once you have them prepped, in this case, green is for ground, white is neutral, and black is live. This is what will eventually get plugged into my wall outlet to provide the power to my 5 volt 60 amp unit. The next thing I'm going to do is cut two different pairs of 18 gauge silicone wires that will each be about 12 inches long. I'm going to strip the wires and again use some of the ferrule terminals on the ends. I'm only going to use one pair for now and the red wire I'll be inserting into one of the positive terminals and the black into one of my negatives. I'll be using an ESP32 module with WLED installed on it, and if you're not sure how to do that, I did make a full walkthrough of the easy steps to get that up and running that you can watch if interested. Now to get things connected, I'm going to use these 20 gauge breadboard jumper wires that I found recently on Amazon. And when compared to the normal 24 gauge ones I used a long time ago, you can see just how much thicker these new ones are. I'm going to take the female end of the red wire and plug it into the VIN pin. The white one will go into the GND pin right next to it, and I'll take my green jumper wire and put it into the D2 pin of the module. Now on the back of our first matrix panel, I'm going to take the male end of the jumper wires that we just plugged into the module and insert them to the corresponding voltage, ground, and data slots on the lead connector wires. And again, there's many different ways you could go about getting these connected, but in my opinion, this is probably the quickest option. From here, I'm going to use a couple inline Wago clips to connect the red voltage wire from the power to the red voltage wire on the panel, and then I'll do the exact same thing for the black ground connections. So that's just a quick refresher on getting a single matrix wired up, but I'll wait until we get the additional three panels added before walking you through the setup configuration in the app, which might be the part that trips the most people up when trying to get everything to work. First, I'm going to disconnect my Wago clips to the panel, and then I'll be adding the second pair of red and black wires that we prepped earlier on in the video to the second positive and negative posts on the supply. Here, I'll be adding a three-piece Wago connector to each of the positive and negative wires. Now as far as the panels, I'm going to put them in a square configuration which will give us one large 32x32 32 32 matrix to work with. And what I found to be easiest is making sure the panels are in the exact same position. What I mean by this is if you take a closer look, there are two separate copper pads on the front that are kitty cornered to each other. One side has no chip above the LED and the other one does. I'm going to make sure that the one side that has no chip is always on the bottom left when eventually connecting these together. And when everything is eventually set up, we want to have the data traveling in the order you're seeing on the screen, with one being where the controller will be connected. So now let's get these flipped around so we can begin to wire everything up. I'm going to take all four of my red injection wires and plug them into the open Wago connectors coming from the power supply, and then I'll be doing the same for my black ground cables. For getting the data to travel from one matrix to the next, there are again many different ways you could go. You could very well just plug the end leads from the first matrix into the beginning lead of the second and that would work just fine like you're seeing now. However, since the wires are so short, doing it this way is pretty tricky, especially when you flip things around and try to put them in place. So instead, since each panel is already receiving power via the ejection wires, I technically only have to make sure the data wire is making the jump. And again, many different ways you could do this, but I'm going to use another 20 gauge jumper wire that has one female and one male end to make the connection. This extra slack is going to make it a lot easier to arrange the panels in the next step.
So as you can probably gather from looking at this, there's really no good way to make them stay put. We'll deal with this shortly, but for now I'm just going to go around and make sure all four panels are in the correct orientation that I want, which is at the corner with the copper pad and no chip is on the bottom left. And finally, I'm going to reconnect the controller to the first panel just like we did previously in the video. Now some of you might be concerned that this is how I'm going to demo things, but don't worry, it's not. So what I'm going to do is take one of the panels and a piece of paper and make an outline of the square as well as approximately where the wires are connected. Next, I'm going to use the extra piece of shelving board I had laying around and use the template to mark where the wires are at. Then I'll be using a 7 8 inch Forstner bit to drill. This is going to allow me to feed the wires through so that the actual matrix panels can sit flat on the surface. I still ended up using some electrical tape to keep things from moving around, but now everything will be able to line up to make one big 32 by 32 display. And finally, I can just quickly reattach things in the same manner as before. So once things are plugged in, you can fire up WLED. Hit the plus icon near the top right and select Discover Lights. When the scan is complete, hit the check mark and you should now see the new device which will always default to WLED. Go ahead and click into it and the first thing I'm going to do is go into Configure and then into our LED Preferences. Now recently I've noticed that the default GPIO data pin is set to 16. Since I'm using pin D2 on my module, I need to delete the 16 and instead put 2 in this field. Right above that, I need to put in the total number of LEDs, since each 16x16 16 matrix has 256 LEDs, and I have a total of 4 panels, this is going to equal 1024 pixels. And then near the top, the last thing I'll do on this page is increase my brightness limiter from 850 up to 3000 milliamps. Click save, and now when we hit the power, all the lights should turn on. Now go back into Configure, and this time go into 2D Configuration and change the 1D Strip dropdown to 2D Matrix. And this is where the fun begins. Since our individual panel dimensions are 16x16, 16 16, we first need to update these numbers where it defaults to say 8x8. In my current setup, I know I have two horizontal and two vertical panels, so I'll fill that in next. And since my controller is connected to this specific matrix, in the first panel section, I have to put bottom right. And then also, don't forget to check the serpentine box. Scrolling further down, we now have to let the program know the orientation of each matrix. In the panels that I use, the copper pads that do have the little chip by it is where the first LED is located, and since I position them all in the same way, I can put top right for every one. I can leave it at horizontal, and again, make sure you check all the serpentine boxes. Now the last thing we have to do is click on Segments, open up the drop-down, and change our X and Y stop each to 32. Hit the check mark, and we can now start to play around. The first thing I'm going to do, and a good test to see if everything is wired up correctly, is go to the scrolling text under Effects. Now most effects will have these additional sliders at the bottom that will change many aspects of the animation. For this, you can change the speed, position, trail, and size. The scrolling text does default to the date and time, but if you wanted to change it to something else, all you have to do is go back to segments, click on the edit icon next to where it says segment 0, and put in what you want, and hit the check mark. It will then automatically change it to whatever you put. Moving on, let's next go to the black hole effect. You can see there's a lot of different sliders that you can play around with that will completely change the look of the animation, so make sure this is something that you check out with everyone. This next one I'm going to spend a little bit of time highlighting some of the customization that you can do. Of course you still have the different sliders, but for many of the effects you can go back to the color tab and choose from one of the many different color palettes that come preloaded. It's super easy to do and fun to see how different colors look for different animations. Now staying on the same animation, you can go back into segments and by clicking the mirror boxes, you get this cool kaleidoscope type effect. It's crazy the sheer number of ways you can tweak things to get it to look just the way you want. 
So that about does it for this walkthrough, and I did want to mention that I'm currently working on a couple new Sound React videos that test out some of these new effects that I hope to be done within a week or two. So from here, I'll just continue to play some of my favorite animations in case you're curious to see more, but as always, thanks so much for watching and let me know if you have any questions at all.